Today I'll be in regular John 4, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. You guys know who Tim Hawkins is? Tim Hawkins is a, a Christian comedian. You guys seen Tim Hawkins? Tim Hawkins has a joke that I always thought was really funny. Uh, he's got a joke about how you can tell how long basically someone's been going to church by what they do with their hands during the worship service. Have you, have you seen that joke of his? He talks about how, you know, if you're new to church, typically your hands are down pretty low, usually in your pockets, you know, you're not really sure what to do with them. Someone who's been at church for a little while, you know, maybe their hands are out of their pockets, maybe they're out here. He calls that the, the carrying the TV, I think is what he calls that one. He says that you can always tell if someone's been in church for a long time, the higher their hands are. He says this one up here he calls the touchdown, you know. So he's got a long joke about that. But I always thought that was funny because it's true, right? There's a lot of different ways that people like to worship and express themselves during a worship service. And you know, there's over, uh, there's, uh, they say there's somewhere over 2 billion Christians in the world, which is just a whole lot, <laughs> more than we can even imagine. Over 2 billion Christians in the world from all over, obviously, different countries, different cultures, different languages. And when you think about that, there's just so many different ways that people worship around the world, isn't there? So many different ways that people express uh, their love and their praise for God. You know, I, I, uh, we were in a couple small town, couple churches in a couple small towns when I was a kid, you know, and in uh, those small town churches, as many of you know, it's usually just one piano and the hymnals, right? And so that's, that's kind of the primary uh, method of worship that I grew up with as a kid, just singing out of the hymnals. Uh, then when I was a teenager, I was going to a bigger church, and we had a whole separate service just for the teens. And so the worship there was, of course, a lot of loud rock music, right? Really loud stuff. And going to the teen conferences with 2,000 kids, it's just even louder. And so I've experienced that. Uh, I was part of a small church plant up in Florissant for a while, uh, where the only thing they did was just one acoustic guitar. That's all it was, one acoustic guitar, kind of a hippie style music that they were doing there. Uh, my mom grew up Pentecostal, so Pentecostals obviously got those Pentecostal churches have a whole different style of worship. Uh, Scott and Catherine come from the non, uh, non-instrumental Church of Christ background, uh, no instruments at all, so that's a different style of worship. Um, if you've ever been to an African-American church, I've visited a few. Of course, their style of worship is a lot different than what we do here, right? And so there's just, that's just in America. There's tons of different ways that people express themselves in worship, isn't there? And it's more than just the type of music we listen to as well. There's a lot of different preferences that people have, you know? Should we have the lights on or off, right? Should we stand up or sit down? Should we clap our hands or not clap our hands, how many songs should we sing, right? There's just so many different things that uh, people think about and, and different preferences that people have. We're in the middle of our, our series here called Better Together, where we're talking about how God's people are capable of so much more when they can learn how to work together and when we can learn how to be united and put some of our differences aside, uh, we're just capable of so much more and we, and we can be so much stronger. And today we're going to talk about, specifically, about our worship gatherings. We're going to talk about what kind of worshipers do we want to be? Because you have a choice, right? You have a choice. What kind of a worshiper do you want to be as an individual? And what kind of worshipers do we want to be as a church when we are together? So let's open up John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 4 through 9 to start off. Talking about Jesus, it says, Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Uh, So interesting thing to think about here is that uh, Jesus is at a well that Jacob, the, the Uh, renamed Israel by God, the father of the Israelites, one of the patriarchs of the nation, sat at this very same well. So it's very interesting to think about that. It said it was about noon. And then it says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. 
The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And so this is a very unlikely conversation that Jesus is having, right? Uh, doesn't matter what they talk about. Just the fact that they're talking at all is very, very unlikely. And she makes that clear. She's, how can you ask me for a drink? You're not even supposed to be talking to me. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We're not supposed to be doing this right now. We're not supposed to be around each other, associating with each other. First of all, Jews did not associate with Samaritans. They were kind of next door neighbors in their region. They had a lot of differences, cultural differences, religious differences. Jews considered it just plain bad, dirty to associate with Samaritans. They were, they were not good people. You weren't supposed to talk to them. On top of that, Men in that culture, men of high status, typically did not associate with women of no status, right? If you were a man man of high status like Jesus, who was a rabbi, typically you wouldn't have lowly conversations with women of no status like that. It's sad, but that's how it was. On top of that, religious leaders like Jesus, didn't they weren't supposed to talk to sinners. They weren't supposed to hang out with sinners, right? Jesus gets chastised by the Pharisees many times for that throughout the rest of the Gospels. What are you doing hanging out with those sinners? You're not supposed to be hanging out with those people. And we learn from the conversation that Jesus has with this woman that uh, she, just like everyone else, of course, she's a sinner. She has a lot of stuff in her past that she's probably not proud of. She's doing things right now that she's not supposed to be doing. And so on many levels, Jesus was just not, according to the social, cultural, religious norms, Jesus was just not supposed to be talking to this woman. (laughs) He just wasn't. So he goes on. To show this woman that he's not an ordinary man, he tells her a lot of things about her life that he, uh, he knows just because he's, of course, the Son of God. And so she recognizes that, hey, this is not an ordinary guy. So let's jump into verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied. By the way, that's not a derogatory uh, thing that he's doing there, saying woman. We could get into the the Greek, but we're not going to. But he's not looking down on her when he, he says woman right here, okay? Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. And so the woman, basically, once she realizes that Jesus is not an ordinary guy, she thinks He's a prophet. Once she realizes this, she asks Him really a very innocent, uh, simple question. She says, hey... If, if anybody knows the answer to this, you're going to know, where is the right place to worship? Where should I worship? Of course, you Jews say that I need to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship. But here in Samaria, here in Samaria we worship in a different place. Where should I go to worship? Because, you know, in, in those times, to fulfill, to check off all of your religious checkboxes, you had to go to the temple at some point. Uh, to make your offerings to the Lord, to make your sacrifices to the Lord, to worship the Lord. You had to do it. And so the question was, where's the right place? Is it, Am I really doing what God wants me to do if I go to the wrong place? Right? That was a major question that they had. And so she's asking a very innocent question here. She's basically, hey, I want to I do the right thing. I want to worship in the right place. Where should I go? <clears throat> and you know, Jesus does what he does with a lot of people. He doesn't really answer her question 100%, at least not the way that she was hoping that it would be answered. He doesn't get into this discussion of Jews versus Samaritans that she's looking for. Uh, Instead, he points the discussion towards the future. And he speaks of a coming time when worship is no longer going to be tied to these sacred sites, uh, but... Worship is going to take place in spirit and in truth, is what he says. He says, there's going to come a time when you're not even going to be worried about whether you're here or there or, you know, in the city or up on the mountain. You need to be worried about 
Are you worshiping in spirit and in truth? And so the woman, she comes to Jesus asking, again, a a very uh, innocent question about, hey, there are these cultural differences that we have in the way that we worship. These things that divide us. um, These differences that we have. You guys worship this way. We worship that way. Which way is right? And Jesus says, you know what? An hour is coming when these questions won't even matter. He says, an hour is coming when you won't even be worried about these things anymore. And so what does matter? He's pointing her to what, towards what does matter. What Jesus says, what does matter, what the Father is really more concerned about is what's going on in our heart when we worship. Not where we're at, but what's going on in our heart. He wants people who worship in spirit and in truth. And so in other words, here are the two things that really matter in our worship. First, are you worshiping in spirit? Is the Holy Spirit moving in your heart, in your life, in your church? Are you in tune with God and His Spirit? Are you really worshiping with a proper attitude and posture when you worship? And secondly, are you worshiping in truth? Are you, when you worship, the, the words that you're singing, are they truthful about who Jesus is and, and what he taught? Right? We want to, obviously, we don't want to be singing uh, songs of, with false doctrine, right? So it is important that we sing things that are truthful about who Christ is. So are we worshiping in spirit and are we worshiping in truth? If those two things are happening, uh, then all is good, basically. <laughs> the Bible does not give us specific format for for how we're to worship, does it? It doesn't say, hey, when you sing songs to the Lord, he really prefers about 115 beats per minute with, you know, some light percussion. Two or three vocalists are acceptable, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, the Bible doesn't get into those things. It's concerned with, again, are we worshiping in spirit and in truth? So, you know, you might have personal preferences in the way that you worship. We all do, right? I have personal preferences. I don't usually talk about them. But we have personal preferences. Um, But, you know, it's important not to confuse your personal preferences with what is right or wrong. Those are two very different things. And Jesus makes that clear. Um, The things you like or dislike is not to be mixed up with uh, what the church needs to be doing, right? Those are two different things. And so uh, the church doesn't necessarily have to cater to, you know, personal preferences. Uh, But what the scriptures do speak on, again, is is your heart and your attitude. Are you worshiping for the right reasons? Are you worshiping in the proper manner, in spirit and in truth? And so, again, if those two things are happening, then all is well. That is the kind of worship that the Father seeks, is what Jesus says. And so, you know, there's a lot of factors in our lives that form these preferences and these understandings that we have of worship isn't there. The, uh, the family, of course, that you grew up with, the, the region that you grow up in, the culture that you grow up in, uh, denominational background, what kind of church you grew up in determines how you, uh, the type of things that you prefer. Um, whether or not you're raised in a Christian home determines that. Um, the kind of friends that you have determines that. All of these different things, they shape and mold us more than we realize, right? If I had grown up in a different area of the world, I would have different preferences than I have right now, right? It's not that what I like is in some intrinsically way better than anything else. It's just that's the way that my upbringing shaped me, right? And these factors, you know, they answer the questions about what we think worship should be. Again, should it be in a big cathedral with stained glass or should it be in a coffee house? We did church in a casino for a while. Should it be loud rock music or should there be an organ? (laughs) Should we be dressed up in our Sunday's best or should we come as we are? Um, should it be a tightly scheduled service or should it be free flowing and spirit led? All of these questions, right? Our upbringing again determines really, um, how we feel about these things. But Jesus says again, in this simple statement, an hour is coming when it's not going to be about the mountain or the city. It's not going to be about these things. It's going to be about something else. 
true, true, true worship, basically, uh, what Jesus is saying, true worship transcends these things. True worship transcends geography or race or, or culture or lighting or noise level or any of these things. True worship transcends all of these things. And again, think about it. Who is Jesus talking to here? Who is Jesus talking to in this conversation? He's talking to a woman he's not supposed to be talking to. He's having a conversation about worshiping with worshiping God with someone that he's not even supposed to like be in the same room as. And so we see just right off the bat the fact that Jesus is even having this conversation with her. Jesus is letting us know that, again, true worship, he, Jesus just breaks down all of these barriers that we put up, right? All of these, these cultural, racial, uh, denominational barriers that we put up. Jesus just breaks them all down. True worship transcends all of these things. Let's read verse 23 again. Jesus says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. That's a very interesting phrase, statement there. They are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. What does that imply? That implies that there are other worshipers that the Father does not seek, right? That statement implies that there is a type of worship that is not pleasing to the Lord, right? But Jesus doesn't say that has, again, that doesn't have anything to do about uh, where you're worshiping or, or the styles or the preferences. It has to do with what's going on in here. What's going on in here is the kind of thing that can displease the Lord, I think we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been at a, uh, at a place. We've all had Sunday mornings where our heart was probably not in the right place while we were worshiping. We've all been there. Something going on in our lives that's just distracting us that morning. Uh, something going on in our heart. Maybe someone in the room that we're holding a grudge against and we can't, you know, we can't move past that. Uh, maybe something going on in the worship service on the stage that we just don't like. You know, I don't like this song, so I'm just going to tune out for the next four minutes. Right? We've all been there where our heart is just not in the right place. And if we're being honest, it's probably displeasing to the Lord. Right? Of course, we're sinners. We've, we've all done this. And, you know, it's, it's really sad to think about over the years, over the centuries in the history of the church, how many times uh, people have worshipped in a way uh, that, that, that the Lord was not happy with. And our hearts were not in the right place. It's happened far too many times. We're prideful people, we're uh, stubborn people, we're bitter people, and, and it happens, right? And sometimes we're even prideful enough to think that, hey, the way I worship is better than the way they worship. And so we're, they're worshiping the wrong way, and so I just can't get into this right now, <laughs> right? But again, that's not the kind of worship God seeks, because at that point, it's not about God, is it? It's about you. <laughs> You've made it about yourself. And so we need to be asking the question, are we the type of worshiper that God seeks? Am I the type of worshiper that God seeks? Am I the kind of person that God uh, is pleased when I worship? Two questions you can ask yourself to try to answer that question, I think. The first is right here in the text. Am I worshiping in spirit and in truth? Am I worshiping in spirit and in truth? The second thing is not in the text, but I think it's a healthy thing to think about. Asking yourself this question. Am I a consumer or a contributor? Am I a consumer or a contributor? There's a book, just disclaimer, I haven't read it, okay? So I'm not like uh, telling you that it's a great book or anything. But the general idea of the book, I uh, was worth noting. There's a book called Cat and Dog Theology basically talks about, it uses the difference between cats and dogs and relates it to the way that we relate to God. It's kind of interesting. Basically, here's the general idea. Uh, dogs, they say, hey, they feed me, they care for me, they love me, they must be God, right? The cat says, they feed me, they care for me, they love me, I must be God. <laughs> for those of you who have cats and dogs, you know the difference, right? I am 
allergic to both. I'm very strongly allergic to cats, so I really don't like cats, okay? Just letting you guys know. But it's true, isn't it? Dogs, they just want to be around you, right? If they are around you, if they are in your presence, if they can hang out with you, they're happy, right? They're happy as long as they're a part of the action. If you are happy, they are happy. Being with you is what's important. A cat, some of you might say they care about you. You're wrong. They don't. (laughs) Cats do not care about you. For a cat, it's all about, are you taking care of my needs? Are my needs being met? That's all that matters for the cat. Right? Yeah, I'm right. Okay, I'm right. And so there's a reason our worship services are called worship services. Someone is being worshipped and someone is being served. And so the question is, who is it? Is God being worshipped? Is God being served? Or am I serving myself? Am I more concerned with what I want in this worship service or with the fact that God is being praised? Which thing is most important? We announced a few weeks ago that we're going to be transitioning in this church to doing bilingual worship every week, which is, of course, a big deal, big change, big step. And again, we're not trying to negate the fact that this is going to be difficult for some people. It's certainly going to be uh, an adjustment, right? It's certainly going to be an adjustment. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be some bumps in the road for sure. There's going to be things that we don't understand all the time. Uh, There's going to be things that are tough to participate in at times. There's going to be a lot of differences, cultural differences, language differences. But guys, we've got to learn how to move past these things, okay? We've got to learn how to move past these things. And listen, this is not just about uh, our bilingual services. This sermon is a sermon that would need to be preached whether we had a Spanish-speaking service in this church or not. Just in our English service, we need to learn how to get past these things. We need to learn how to get past our personal preferences and start worrying about who is being worshipped, who is being served. It's important for every church, not just our church. We need to embrace the mindset that no matter what style of worship we might have here, whether it's the older hymns or the newer stuff or the loud stuff or the quiet stuff, no matter what style, whether it's in English or in Spanish, we can find a way to be worshipful no matter what. We can find a way to be worshipful no matter what. Why is that? Why, how, how is that? How can you find a way to be worshipful when you don't even like the music? And I'll be honest with you guys. I've probably, re- realistically, I've really only been to one church in my life that actually met my personal preferences in worship. Um, but you know what? You can find a way to be worshipful. Why is that? Because who are we worshiping? We're worshiping God, and God is worthy of our praise No matter what, no matter what's going on around you, God is worthy of our praise every day, every every hour. He is a good God. (laughs) He created us. He loves us. He cares for us. He watches over us. He has a desire to bless us, to give us good things. He makes promises to us that he keeps He gave up his life for us. When we abandon him, when we turn our backs on him in our sin, which we all do, he doesn't doesn't turn his back on us. He doesn't abandon us. He sticks with us. He's patient with us. He forgives us. He extends his loving, gracious uh, arms toward us. He shed his blood for us so that we could be forgiven. He conquered the grave. He lives today. He reigns on his throne today. There is a lot, (laughs) there's so much about our God that is worthy of our praise. Our God is a huge, huge God and a good, good God who's worthy of our praise. And you know, when you think about these things, when you think about God, when you put it into proper perspective, what should worship be about? It should be about God. When you put it into that perspective, our little preferences seem so small, don't they? They seem so small and insignificant. When we're thinking about the creator of the universe and the sole purpose is to bring him praise, 
Does it matter what kind of a guitar we're using or how loud it is or whether the lights are on or off? No, these things, they do not matter. God is what matters. It begins and ends with the Lord. And so it's a good lesson for us to learn that God is, he's so much bigger than we give him credit for, isn't he? He created all of these different, that's the thing we forget about. God is the one who created these different styles and cultures and preferences, right? If he wanted to create everyone to be a Midwestern American, you know, he probably could have, but he didn't, did he? He created us as a diverse people with different uh, preferences, with different things that we enjoy, different ways that we like to express ourselves, different ways we like to dance, different ways we like to sing. God is the one who created that in the first place. He's so much bigger than we give him credit for, isn't he? He enjoys. And so what that means is he must enjoy all of these things. If he created them, if he created us to be different, he must enjoy them all, right? He enjoys the different ways that people express their joy and the different ways they express their love for him. So it's a good lesson for us to learn that God doesn't exist in this this small little box that we put him in sometimes. And honestly, I don't want God to exist. I don't want my God to exist in that little box anyway. I like the fact that I serve a God who is creative and who enjoys different things (laughs) and who likes watching different people worship in different ways. Honestly, if our God only enjoyed the style of worship that we have at New Heights, to be honest, that would be pretty depressing, right? I mean, our God is so big and so great. How could we possibly do him justice by only worshiping in one little way? We can't do him justice like that. It doesn't even make sense. He created all of these other things in the first place. Band, you guys can come on up. So guys, hopefully I've got my point across <laughs> that in this church we need to start embracing the mindset that we don't care what style of music is played here. We care about what's going on in our hearts and we care about if God is being praised or not. We just want to make sure God is being praised and the Spirit is moving. And if that is happening, we should be happy. <laughs> you guys know uh, Ben Merrill, he... Uh, preached here a couple years ago for us. He came in one week. He was the pastor at Harvest Hill Christian Church over in St. Charles for many, many years. Ben used to say, this isn't an exact quote, okay, but this is the general idea. Ben always used to say that, hey, you know, I shouldn't like everything that happens in my church. If the church meets every single personal preference that I have, that's actually a bad thing. Because that what that means is... We have created a church that's serving ourself, right? If, if the church meets every single one of your needs and there's nothing in the church that you don't like, that's bad because what that means is we have become a church that's not concerned about reaching people. Because if we're really concerned about reaching the community, reaching people, we're going to have to do things we don't like sometimes. We're going to have to make changes. We're going to have to grow. We're going to have to adapt with the needs of the community. And so if If there's nothing you don't like in your church, that's a bad thing. We should have some things that we don't like. That's good. That's a good sign. We shouldn't like everything in our church service. So again, guys, asking yourself these two questions. Am I worshiping in spirit and in truth? And am I a consumer? Am I more concerned about meeting my own needs? Or am I a contributor? Am I more concerned with contributing, serving the church, and praising the Lord for who He is. What kind of worshipers are we going to be at New Heights? Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for everything You have done and everything You continue to do. And everything that you've promised that you will do for us. We have so much to look forward to. Because of the hope that you give us. We thank you for creating us the way you created us. With differences. We ask that you help us to become a church who learns how to 
put things into perspective when we walk in these doors on Sunday morning and can remember what's important and can put our hearts in the right place and worship in tune with your spirit and worshiping with the sole purpose of praising you for who you are. We ask that you help us to wrestle with this individually and as a church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, guys, we serve a good, good God who is worthy of our praise. He has done 